Good morning, everyone. Thank you for coming today. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for coming today. My name is Caroline Haver. I'm one of the pharmacy residents here at Sarasota Memorial Hospital. And today I will be presenting on Don't Let It Take Your Breath Away, Managing Chronic Obstructive Pulmonary Disease. So some objectives we will be covering today that I'd like you to be able to take home with you include describing chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, also called COPD, discuss the role of smoking cessation and pulmonary rehabilitation in managing COPD, identify medications used for rescue versus maintenance therapy, understand the different types of inhalers, and lastly, review vaccinations recommended for preventing complications and hospitalizations. What is COPD? So this is a condition of limited airflow in the lungs due to exposure to harmful gases or particles. This is a treatable condition, however it is irreversible, so it will not go away. Some subtypes include emphysema, chronic bronchitis, or chronic obstructive asthma. Who does COPD affect? Over 300 million cases of COPD are documented worldwide, and this is projected to be the third leading cause of death by 2020. This most often occurs in patients with a history of smoking, um, primarily cigarette smoking, but can also include pipe, cigar, or marijuana. In addition, occupational exposure, so work exposure to certain dusts or chemicals can also contribute to the development of COPD. Also patients um, whose siblings have COPD, those patients can also be more likely, so it can be um, genetic or run in a family. And overall, prevalence is almost equal in men to women. So let's just take a minute to compare and contrast COPD to asthma, since these both do come up. So COPD usually occurs in patients over the age of 40, whereas asthma usually starts in patients under 40, so like in childhood. Again, COPD um, is characterized by a history of smoking, and it is a chronic airflow limitation. So over time, you have limited airflow in the lungs, and this can progress over time. Whereas asthma is a reactive tightening of those airway muscles due to some type of trigger, some sort of allergen or something else going on. And you have this airway reactiveness that's going on. COPD patients can have symptoms like difficulty breathing or chronic cough. And this can be a productive cough, which means that there's some mucus production going on. Whereas patients with asthma will have shortness of breath or wheezing or have very rapid breathing. Like I mentioned, COPD is progressive and this is not reversible. However, with asthma, this is reversible when you take um, those rescue inhaler medications to treat those symptoms. COPD patients are characterized into stages A through D, whereas asthma patients are categorized as intermediate, mild, moderate, or severe. So now we're going to be talking about the role of smoking cessation and pulmonary rehabilitation in managing COPD. So smoking is key. Smoking cessation is key. Smoking is the only factor proven to prevent progression of COPD. There are various types of assistance programs available. Here in the state of Florida, we have a Florida Quit Line, which offers multiple types of counseling programs. One is to speak with a quit coach, so more of a one-on-one -on -one interaction. There's also group quit sessions, so you can interact with peers and gain counseling experience through that, as well as web quit, where you can be online and document your progress um, by yourself and at home, as well as share your experiences through blogs. Here at Sarasota Memorial Hospital, we have an outpatient, or for patients who are not hospitalized, a lung health clinic that provides medication review, education, and support meetings. And when patients, um, in addition, there's also pulmonary rehabilitation, which is usually a, a treatment program that encompasses nutrition, as well as health, and exercise, both physical exercise and breathing exercises to help strengthen those lungs. 
for patients that are hospitalized and are about to be discharged. We have a COPD resource team that will go in and speak with them, sharing COPD information and assist with medication therapy or counseling. They also may be able to provide smoking cessation products depending on the situation. And first and foremost for smoking cessation, keep trying if you tried it before. There may be another um, pathway of doing this, whether it's a different type of counseling program or different type of product you'd like to use. Don't get discouraged, keep trying. There are some medications that can be used to help um, stop those or reduce those cravings in the scenario of smoking cessation. We do have over-the-counter nicotine replacement products. So these can be gum, which you chew a little bit and then you what we call park or put in the side of your mouth by your cheek. There's also lozenges, so like a cough drop type product, and then patches, which you can apply to the skin. So for these products, you can discuss with your physician and your pharmacist to see if these are the right ones for you and which one would fit best into your normal daily activities. There's also prescription medications that are indicated for helping with smoking cessation. These medications are usually seven to 12 weeks of therapy and start out as once a day dosing and may increase up to twice daily. These two medications include Chantix or Varenicline and Zyban or Repropion. Some common side effects to keep in mind with Chantix include nausea or vomiting, possibly um, trouble sleeping or some vivid dreams. And for Zyban, there can also be some nausea, vomiting, um, as well as some itching, so, um, and a dry mouth. So just sort of keeping in mind if you have tried these products before or if you have other conditions that you do have those symptoms with, being able to compare and contrast with those to see which one may potentially work best for you when having a discussion with your physician. On the horizon coming up is a product called Cytosine which is currently being studied in some clinical trials and is being compared to the Varenicline or Chantix. So these patients that have COPD, what kind of symptoms do they usually present with? So we have four common symptoms that we see include trouble breathing, also called dyspnea, decreased ability to exercise or reduced exercise tolerance, increased cough, with or without that mucus, that can cause that productive cough, and chest tightness. As this disease progresses, patients can have what we call flare-ups or exacerbations where the symptoms are worse than they have been on previous days. So these are symptoms that are continuing despite use of any of your rescue inhalers. Some triggers that can cause these flare-ups include cold weather, allergies, if you have a cold or an infection that's starting to work up in your system, or even emotions if you're having a you know, stressful time, stressful environment. These patients will show um, significant difficulty breathing. They may or may not have chest pain with that. It will be hard to talk because you're having a hard time with the breathing. Again, you can have that increased productive cough, fast heart rate, and where we're really starting to get concerned is if they have decreased mental status. So if your um, loved one or friend is um, not acting as normal, if they're more tired than usual, if they're more confused, as well as if um, they're running a temperature. So over 100.5 Fahrenheit is something we want to look into um, and seek medical attention because there might be some other cold or infection or other type of thing contributing to this. So what do we want to do during the flare-ups? We want to avoid smoke or any other irritants, so like strong perfumes or soaps. We recommend against using cough suppressants, so those ones that you can find over the counter, we actually recommend against, because that could be masking some underlying cold or infection that's going on. We do recommend you using those rescue inhalers that you have to try and reduce some of the symptoms that you're having. But don't wait before getting medical help if you are experiencing those symptoms we just talked about or if that rescue inhaler is not working for you. When to seek immediate medical attention is when a patient or your, care, your family member is having an immediate allergic or hypersensitivity reaction. So this is when a person experiences swelling um, or um, inflammation of the throat, the lips, or the tongue. They can have significant difficulty breathing with this, as well as itching or rash or hives. 
Although this is rare, when this does happen, we do need to seek immediate medical attention. So let's catch our breath and review. Some common symptoms of COPD include A, increased cough, B, chest tightness, C, trouble breathing or dyspnea, D, decreased ability to exercise, or E, all of the above. E. Absolutely, yes. So all of the above are common symptoms of COPD. So let's now discuss the types of medications that are used to manage COPD. So as I go through the rest of this presentation, there's three common classes of medications. And so what I've done is highlighted the endings of those names to help better recognize these. So the first class of medications is, ends in OL, and these work by opening up your airways. And some examples of these include albuterol or indicaterol. Another class of medications end in tropium. And these again work to open the airways, but just in a slightly different way than those olds do. Some examples of these include ipratropium and teotropium. The last class that we're going to cover include the stones, which are your inhaled steroids. And these work by reducing the swelling or that inflammation in your airways. And some examples include lomatazone and fluticasone. Some common side effects to keep an eye on when you are taking these medications. So any of these classes can cause dizziness, headache, or actually some cough. But keeping in mind those oils may cause some heart racing, which may be uncomfortable for some patients, as well as a shaking or tremor. The trograms may cause some dry mouth, as well as a bitter metallic taste, but this does go away. And the stones can cause a scratchy voice or um, a condition we call thrush, which we're going to go into now. So thrush is some white areas or bumps that can develop in the mouth. They can be on the tongue or on the, um, the gum line area. And what this is caused by is that steroid medication sort of sitting in, the, in your mouth, not being able to get out, and it can cause a fungal infection. So to prevent this, we recommend rinsing your mouth with water after using the inhaler and spitting that water out, so that way you've gotten all that extra drug that may still be sitting around out. So the medications for COPD are chosen based on two different factors of patients. The first one we look at is the severity of the patient's symptoms. So how much coughing, chest tightness, and limited daily activities are they experiencing? As well as breathlessness. Are you just breathless going uphill, up a couple flights of stairs, or even when you're just um, sitting? The other factor is the history of those flare-ups that we talked about earlier that may or may not lead to hospitalization. So like I mentioned previously, COPD patients are categorized into stages A through D, and A is the first stage. These patients experience minimal symptoms, so minimal coughing or limited daily activities. They're, they become breathless with very difficult exercise or going up those couple levels. And they may have zero or maybe one um, severe flare-ups, but this does not cause them to have to go to the hospital. So overall, they have minimal symptoms at rest or with some exertion. So these patients may just require a short-acting or rescue inhaler. So your short-acting inhalers are your rescue inhalers. These can come as meter dose inhalers or as nebulizers. They usually work in five to 10 minutes and they'll last around four to six hours. And the goal of these are to be used during flare-ups or when you've overexerted yourself with some exercise or going up a couple levels, but they're not intended for continuous use. So this is our MDI, our meter dose inhaler. So what this is is a liquid medication that's in this cartridge on top that's turned into a mist when you push the cartridge down. This is helpful for patients that want to be able to bring an inhaler with them when they leave the house. So you can just put this in your purse or in your pocket. It's also helpful for patients that want to use a smaller device, and as I'll go into the nebulizers or larger devices. 
Um, one caveat of these is that patients need to be able to coordinate your breathing with pushing in this canister. So some advantages, like I mentioned, you can take this with you. There are multiple uses, so there's multiple doses within this canister before you need to get a new inhaler. It takes a relatively short amount of time to use one of these. And there's less risk of um, growing bacteria in this than in the nebulizer. Some limitations include that coordination with being able to push on the canister and breathing in at the exact same time to be able to get that medication into your lungs. So in that case, we can suggest patients use what we call spacer. So what we have is this um, barrel that attaches to the mouthpiece of your MDI inhaler, and the patient will put this on their face, and so the medication, when you push down, comes into the barrel and hangs around. So you don't have to breathe and push at the same time. You can use a normal breathing pattern and get the medication that way. Another caveat of these is that the drug may stay in the mouth or throat versus some of the other inhaler types. In addition, um, these MDIs in, um, require priming with shaking before use. So what that means is the first time you use it or if you have not used it in several days, you're going to have to shake the inhaler, point it away from you and remove the cap and push three times. So we do need to have some dexterity in being able to shake it and be pushing that. Some examples of your meter dose inhalers include albuterol, which is commonly called Pro-Air or Ventolin, or we have Ipratropium, which is called Atrovent, and these are usually used as two puffs inhaled through the mouth, so try not to breathe through your nose, every four to six hours as needed. Another inhaler device that we have are the nebulizers. So this is when the medication is put in as a cartridge into a machine that hooks up to some tubing, and then you have your mouthpiece here. So the medication cartridge is placed in, and the liquid is turned into a mist, and the mist is what you breathe in through the mouthpiece, or they can have a mask that covers the nose and the mouth. This is helpful for more elderly patients that have less ability to hold and push that canister down, like with the MDIs. So if you have like arthritis, or if you have some shaking from Parkinson's disease, this may be an easier route to go. Also, patients who cannot hold their breath very long or breathe in forcefully, this is a um, more convenient way of breathing in the medication for them. So like I said, some advantages include not having to breathe and push at the same time. You can use a normal breathing pattern with this mouthpiece. So this can be helpful for those patients that have difficult time using those hand inhalers. This does not require any breath holding. And the dose can be modified. So as I'll go into the next, it takes over about 25 minutes to receive this medication. So if you stop using it early, then you do not receive that full dose. Again, these medication, this equipment can be large. So it can be bulkier, especially compared to your MDI, which you can just put in your bag and go. And it may require some training prior to use. And these do require frequent cleaning compared to your MDIs because you have that device, you have all this tubing, and the mouthpiece needs to be cleaned as well. Some examples of the nebulizer medications include the combination of albuterol and infratropium called duoneb, or you can just have the albuterol. And this is usually taken as one dose inhaled through the mouth every four to six hours as needed for those symptoms. So just to summarize the comparison between the MDIs and the nebulizers, that MDI requires that priming and shaking before use. It's much easier to take with you than the nebulizer machine. Since it does require breathing and um, pushing the canister at the same time, you may actually want to use the spacer with that, so it does require that coordination. However, the nebulizer may require coordination by, with using the machine itself. And again, both of these medications are going to be providing multiple doses before you need a new device. So let's catch our breath and review. True or false, the MDI rescue inhaler is portable, but requires priming compared to the nebulizer. True. True. Perfect, yes. <laughs> 
So what inhalers are used as a COPD worsens or progresses? So like I've mentioned, patients can progress through the stages. So depending on those level of symptoms the patient's experiencing, as well as how, much, how breathless they are upon um, exercise or going uphill, and the number of flare-ups. As these go up, the stages increase. So in stage B, patients will still have that rescue inhaler like they had in stage A, but we will be adding on a long-acting or maintenance inhaler. For stage C, you still have your rescue inhaler. You have that one maintenance inhaler medication. But if you're having those continued symptoms, we may add on a second inhaler or second medication. When patients um, progress to stage D, they're having significant symptoms even at rest. They're having multiple um, flare-ups and potentially multiple hospitalizations. So they can require that short-acting rescue inhaler. Those two long-acting inhalers carry over from stage C but they may add on a third inhaler or a third medication type. Other options can include some other medications like Rifulinolast, or these patients may require antibiotics. They may stop their inhaled steroid medication if they had been using that previously, or that may be what is added, depending on what their uh, previous regimen was. And they may even require oxygen supplementation. So our maintenance inhalers, can come as those meter dose inhalers, but they can also be dry powder inhalers or soft mist inhalers. These usually last 12 to 24 hours after you use that dose, and they are um, recommended to be used every day regardless of your symptoms. So even if you're feeling well that day, that's fantastic, but you do need to continue to use your medication each day to prevent those symptoms from flaring. And so like I said, the goal of these is to prevent flare-ups and hospitalizations. So we've sort of gone over our meter dose inhalers so far. So those same advantages and limitations do follow through. Again, they're portable. They have multiple doses within that cartridge. They don't take very long to administer. Um, they do still require that coordination with pushing down and bringing that medication in. But one thing we do need to keep in mind is that these now can have combinations of medications in them, so they can have that steroid, that sewn medication. So we want to make sure that we are rinsing our mouth out after using that inhaler if that medication is in there. Some examples of the long-acting meter dose inhalers include Advair or Sibacort. And these are usually taken as two puffs inhaled through the mouth twice daily. The next group we have are the dry powder inhalers. So these are inhalers where the medication is actually a dry powder. It's not like a liquid that turns into a mist like the ones we've talked about so far. And you are breathing in that dry powder. So these are helpful for patients that, again, want to bring an inhaler with them if they're going on vacation or going out because these are pretty small and able to put in their pocket. These are more helpful for patients in the earlier stages of COPD because you do need that forceful breath in to get that medication into your lungs. These can be helpful for patients with less hand strength if you have like arthritis or um, any type of injury to them. And a lot of these inhalers can have a dose counter window, so they'll have a little window that has the number of doses left that will help you keep track of when you're going to need a refill. And there's a wide variety of dry powder inhaler types. So if patients like a certain color or a certain shaped inhaler, you do have the ability to um, show some preference for one over another in this type. So like I mentioned, some advantages are they're portable. They have that dose counter window that helps you keep track of how many are left. They can be either single dose or multiple use. So for example, your discus inhaler, you have all the doses in there. You breathe, you hold it like a sandwich and breathe that in forcefully. Whereas your Spiriva inhaler has foil um, blister packed capsules where you'll take the capsule out and you'll put one capsule or dose into the inhaler, and then you'll close that up and you breathe that in. So that's a single dose. So you'll have to put in a new capsule for each dose. 
again, your breath is delivering that medication, and this takes a relatively short amount of time to administer. Some limitations are that these do contain a dry powder, so we want to avoid tipping the medication to um, not lose any of that powder, as well as keeping them in dry environments, so not in any human environment, such as your car, in the bathroom, or in the kitchen, because the powder can then clump and then won't be able to be administered as well. There are some numerous designs of these inhalers, so you may be able to choose one shape or color, but then it can be confusing if you used one and now you need to use another, you might need to get some new instructions on how to use that new inhaler. These also can have a limited shelf life, so we want to keep an eye on that dose counter window and the expiration date of these. And again, some of these can include that sewn steroid medication, so we want to rinse our mouth after using those to prevent brush. <coughs> One thing to note is that these dry powder inhalers do have lactose particles in with that drug, and those help to deliver that medication better to your lungs. So we do recommend avoiding these if patients have a severe milk allergy, um, severe milk protein allergy. However, this should not affect patients with lactose intolerance. So some examples of your dry powder inhalers, again, including your Spareva hand inhaler, where you're putting the capsule in, or we have a Brio inhaler. So this is an lift up, where you'll um, pull the cap over and you'll breathe in, taking care to not put your hand in front of, they have little vent windows. And then we have our discus inhaler, which you'll hold sort of like a sandwich and breathe in that way. These are intended to be used as one inhalation once a day or two inhalations by mouth twice a day, depending on the inhaler. Our last group of inhaler devices include these soft mist inhalers. So what these are, they're similar to your MDIs, except the medication comes out as a misty cloud when the release button is pushed. So it comes out as a misty plume of medication. These are good for patients that want to be able to bring their inhaler with them because again it's relatively small and portable. These are also helpful for patients that are not able to breathe in forcefully unlike those DPIs where that's the um, way to get the medication in your lungs. And again these will have a dose counter window which makes it easier to keep track of how many doses are left. So these soft mist inhalers do not have any capsules. So like I showed in the previous Spareva where you have to put the capsule in, all the medication is in the cartridge. They also do not have a propellant in there. So when, you're, um, when the medication is going into your mouth, into your lungs, you don't have a cool or sort of pressured feeling from the propellants. These also can deliver the medication um, better into your lungs because it's got that, that mist action. There are the dose counters, and you do not need a spacer for these. Some limitations include it does require priming, like those MDIs that we talked about, and it does require some amount of coordination between breathing in and um, pushing the um, button. Some examples of these include Stravarity or Steolto, and these are taken as two inhalations by mouth, once daily. So just to compare these, on the left we have our MDIs, here we have our DPI, or that's Spareva, where the capsule is placed in, we have our soft mist inhaler, and then we have our nebulizers. So overall, priming is required with the MDIs and the soft mist inhalers. All of these are relatively portable, except for the nebulizer device. Breath coordination with pushing the buttons is needed for your NDIs and SMIs, but keeping in mind your nebulizer may require coordination with you being able to operate that um, device or machine. All of these can contain multiple doses before needing a new device, however those DPIs again can have that single capsule or single dose as well. So let's review some frequently asked questions that usually come up with COPD. 
So timing of inhaler use. The number one reason for hospital admittance is not using the inhalers properly. So this is something we wanna make sure that we're educating about of how to use all of these different types. There is no order required for using one inhaler before another. However, we can um, consider using that old medication before your sewn medication. And the idea behind that is the OL is opening up those airways so that the sewn medication can get in even easier. Also, if more than one puff is required, for example, when using your Rescue Pro Air inhaler, you need to wait one minute before those puffs, before the second puff. Best inhaler practices include utilizing a calendar or alarms as reminders to be taking those maintenance doses each day, even when your symptoms are doing good and you're having a good day. We want to request refills prior to running out of these medications, so utilizing those dose windows when we can, or using a calendar or alarm to keep track of how many days you've been using that inhaler. We also want to store the, store the inhalers in a dry area so not in the kitchen, not in the bathroom, not in the car, and keeping away from children to keep it in its best condition possible. Some resources for reviewing inhaler use. So every time you go to pick up your inhaler, ask your pharmacist to go over again with you what's the best way to be using that type. There was a study that found that 78% of patients incorrectly performed at least one step of their inhaler use. You can also visit that inhaler's website if you have a computer um, for videos as well as picture diagrams of step-by-step -step how to use those inhalers. And you can always ask um, COPD resource when you're attending your COPD lung clinic if you do have access to one of those. So let's catch our breath and review. Which long-acting inhaler or inhalers require coordination with breath and pushing the inhaler? Is it R, A, MDIs, B, DPIs, or C, SMIs? A and C. A and C, exactly. So those are the two that need that coordination, whereas the DPIs, that the drug is delivered by you taking that forceful breath in. So how do we work to prevent complications and possible hospitalizations? Our guidelines recommend two different types of vaccinations. The first one is the influenza or flu vaccine. This is recommended for all patients with COPD, and this is one dose or one flu shot each year. Another vaccination is the pneumococcal, which works to reduce the risk of pneumonia or even bacterial infections in the blood. This is recommended for all patients with COPD over the age of 65 years with a repeat dose every five years. And it's even recommended for patients under 65 years that have COPD, but because they also have other chronic or long-term conditions of the heart or the lungs. So additional resources that are available for cost questions, you can always ask your physician and or your pharmacist what other inhalers are available in that same medication class if you are unable to afford the one that they're currently prescribing to you. Like I've mentioned, those DPIs, there's a wide variety of types. Insurance may cover one versus another. So you can also contact your insurance company directly, or you can go online and try and find their formulary, and you can discuss which inhalers are covered and what those costs would be. So are there any additional resources available with us here today? Yes, we do have some pamphlets available in the back that have information about smoking cessation, including on that Florida quit line. We have the effect of smoking on your pets, so not just the people in your household, but your furry friends with you, as well as the Lung Health Clinic, which is available for patients on the outpatient or not hospitalized side, and the Sarasota Memorial Lung Cancer Screening Program. So in summary, COPD is a progressive but irreversible condition. There's a wide variety of both rescue and maintenance inhalers available to patients. And the proper use of these inhalers and nebulizers 
uh, optimizes that medication delivery to your lungs and subsequently will reduce those symptoms. And overall, lifestyle modifications, pulmonary rehabilitation, and vaccinations can help to manage COPD and reduce the risk of complications and hospitalizations. Here are some references. What questions do you all have? Yes. So smoking cessation is the biggest thing to contribute to the stop the progression? It, it definitely is one of the major factors that leads to the disease ah. and leads to the progression of the disease as well. So that is a lifestyle modification that can be done, but yes, plays a significant role in preventing any further progression. And I feel like there's not an easy answer for this, but is, yes. is it that you are a you know, pack a day smoker for 20 years before you start developing COPD or is it really varied by the person where? That is a great question. I would like to say that it is a more chronic, a long-term type of, um, the more smoking you're doing and the longer term that that's happening, that your lungs have that longer term exposure to those um, particles and irritants that over time will progress into this like obstructive condition. Do you, do you feel like vaping is also maybe early to tell if it leads to COBT, COBPD? <laughs> yeah, um, so yes, I would say vaping does play a role as well. Um, they're still doing lots of studies on vaping, um, but again, it's the idea that you're taking in chemicals or ingredients into the lungs and exposing that lung and those airways to um, different chemicals that wouldn't normally be there. Okay, thank you very much everyone.